Ron, uh, Friday night. I, I really appreciate uh, when you kind of minister the uh, communion yeah. and the way that you have a unique way of doing that and, and sharing the, the covenant promises that are inherent in communion. And it blessed me. I want you to know that. I appreciate it very much. And uh, Suzanne, thank you for leading us in worship. You and Mike, you're just amazing. We appreciate you so much. I'm not trying to give you a big head. I just really mean it. We really love you guys and appreciate all that you do. And really happy for, uh, for you guys uh, and, and your family to continue to grow and see God bless them and prosper. And it's just a, it's a great thing to see how God moves in people's lives when they open themselves up to praise the Lord. So God bless all of you. Thank you for being here. Be blessed. Amen. Amen. Choose to be blessed. Facebook. We appreciate you being with us this morning, being a part of the service. We love you. You are a part of the service. You are as an integral part. Of it. You're as much a part as we are here, and uh, we appreciate that. Let's come together in the spirit, join together, and uh, lift up the name of the Lord, praise Him, honor Him in our lives together and individually. So God bless all of you, especially those of you that are here this morning. We appreciate you coming out and braving the uh, rain and the mass. It's better than what it was two weeks ago. I, I thought going by the uh, pond out there by the uh, Thomas Mitchell Park, they had, uh, two weeks ago they were ice fishing out there. So, so I mean, this is better. Unless you're an ice fisherman, of course. <laughs> uh, and I'm grateful to God for getting us through this uh, kind of weird weather we've had this winter and all the other craziness that's going on. But God's on the throne. He's got it all under control. We just have to trust in him. I'm wondering about this, you know, if they uh, aren't the teachers, will the librarians get silencers? <laughs> so, well, I'm going to touch this raw note there with somebody. I don't know, praise the Lord. But uh, how about that? Here's some good uh, information for you. Did you know that alligators can grow up to 15 feet? Yeah. But I've never seen one with more than four. Sins that are past. Now let me just say this before we go any further. 
lot of times people say, okay, well, that's past sin. What about today? What about next week? That literally translates past. Is that word past there is literally translated mercy seat passing over. So he's not talking about past sins. He's saying when we come to the mercy seat, those sins, all sin, is passed away. Yeah. All sin has been dealt with in Jesus. Amen? So when God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that have been met at the mercy seat or have passed over the mercy seat and have been forgiven through the forbearance of God or through the goodness of the love of God. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It's excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Praise the Lord. And now Romans chapter 5, and I want to read verses uh, 1 through 21, which is the entire chapter. Romans chapter 5. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope it is not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet for adventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, Death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift of grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by the one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses under justification. For if by one man's offense death reign by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men under justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Praise the Lord. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 5 and 7. 5 through 7. Praise the Lord. Deuteronomy 6, verses 5 through 7. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. So we'll finish this with Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 10 through 12. This is Nehemiah, uh, here we're going to go to chapter 8, verses 10 through 12. Leading up to this is the rebuilding of the walls and 
they're trying to get the temple back up, and uh, the reading of the law comes, and these people are all really feeling bad about the situation that they're in, about the state of the temple, the look of the temple, and so forth. But here's what God responds to when they're all they're all wanting to cry because they see the state of the temple, they see the condition of their uh, of this temple, and it's not like it was originally, right, or like God intended it to be when it was first created. So He said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat. I'm going to just let me make the analogy here. We may look at ourselves, we may look at what we call the temple of God, or what is described as the temple of God, which is our human bodies. And we may see the state of, we may see our condition, we may see our fluctuations and our risings and our fallings and get all disappointed and get discouraged and, and boo-hoo and, and wah-wah and because it isn't everything we would like it to be. But here's God's response to that. He said to them, go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our God. Neither be ye sorry. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites stilled all the people, saying, Hold your peace, for the day is holy. Neither be ye grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and to drink, and to send portions, and to make great mirth, because they had understood the word that was declared unto them. And I'm telling you, when we get to the place that we understand the words of God, we're going to be partying like it's 1999. Praise the Lord. We're going we're gonna to learn to enjoy this life that God has given us in the context in which he's given us. And that is to enjoy it, to love it, to have, uh, you know, celebrate life. Amen? The problem is we have this poor image. And I'm not trying to be egotistical or prideful. I'm just saying God is the one who describes us as the righteousness of God. He's the one that tells us it's all good in Jesus, and we have every right to be celebrating every day of our life because we have been redeemed from the curse of the law. We've been redeemed from judgment and, and uh, punishment for our own behavior. What, under what other circumstances would we not want to have a party? What, and what other kind of circumstances would it take for us that would be greater than this to celebrate, to have a, a celebration? than to know that God has accepted us in the beloved and said, hey, it's all good between you and me. Just enjoy life now because you've got nothing but good coming for you. You've got nothing but positive to look forward to in this life and in the life to come. Praise the Lord. You know, not many people have fulfilled the purpose of our creation. I, I'm just saying, too few people know how to glorify God. How do you glorify God? By loving Him. By praising him, by declaring him to be a good God. Not this evil, judgmental, hateful thing, but this God who loves us with a love that we can't even totally comprehend. Praise the Lord. So what causes us to miss the purpose of our creation? Let's go back to the book of beginnings and look at some clues here. In Genesis chapter 1, let's read verses 26 through 29. Genesis 1, 26 through 29. This is going to be very simple this morning. I'm not trying to get deep or profound. I'm just trying to get us all on the same page. And for those of you that are with us uh, on the internet, <clears throat> I don't know who all of you are. I, I know some of you, but I don't know all of you. So there could be people that are watching that are not born again, that don't know the Lord, who have uh, a desire to know more or to understand some things, or maybe to get delivered from some negative religious things. I don't know all that. I, I know the people that I'm looking at here are born again. So I'm not addressing you in that sense, but I want to remind you that there are people all around us, as Tim said this morning, we take for granted that they had some sort of exposure to God, you know, in a personal way. But that's not true. A huge numbers of people have never had any personal contact with God whatsoever. Outside of, as Tim rightly said, through a, maybe in a wedding service or a funeral or, you know, maybe they came on Easter or something, but they really didn't pick up on anything that was really directed to them personally. It always ends up being about a religious activity or ritual of some kind. But God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, 
she was taken out of famine. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and get this, were to shame. Praise the Lord. So it's obvious that God created man, and he created him for a relationship with him. He didn't need more service. He didn't need more angelic beings. He didn't need more yes people. He wanted human beings. He wanted family. He wanted someone to love, somebody to have a relationship with. You say, does God have to have? No, but that's what God wanted, or he wouldn't have done it. Amen? He's the self-existent one. He doesn't need anybody, but he wanted relationship. And he wanted it with men, not with angelic beings, not with, not with that type of thing, not with servants, but with people who had a choice, a free will, to decide, will I love God or will I reject him? Amen? And that's why he created the first man and woman as free beings, so they had choices. Creatures who could choose their own destiny. The nature of that choice was obvious from the very beginning. Amen. They could choose one of two trees in the garden. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil or the tree of life. The tree of independence from God or the tree of relationship with God. They opted for independence. And when Adam and Eve chose independence from God, they immediately found themselves self-conscious. Remember Genesis 2.25? They weren't ashamed when they were created naked. They saw that they were, but they weren't ashamed of it. They, they didn't have any bad vibes about it at all. Until they rejected the love of God and relationship with God, now all of a sudden, they're humiliated and ashamed. They realized they were naked. And for the first time, they experienced shame. They panicked. And what did they do? They dove into the bushes look for a place to hide. And ever since, natural human beings have been living self-consciously. Amen. Some are conscious of how well they're doing, pride, arrogance. And some are conscious of how poorly they're doing. It's still pride. It's still self-consciousness. But all of them are full of self. And just about everyone is looking for some place to hide. All of fallen humanity has a consciousness of being incomplete, of being flawed. That's the result of original sin in the human race. And religion perpetuates this. Instead of telling you about the love of God, the goodness of God, and the, and the deliverance of God, it tells you about what you need to do. And we've already read there's nothing you can do except believe in the love of God and the mercy of so wherever you are watching this or hearing this, or if you'll hear it later, you, you'll, you'll listen to it uh, later on through the archives and what have you, I want you to know, your life may be a total chaotic mess, and you may feel like you're the biggest jerk in the world. Join the club. God says you are his righteousness. He loves you. Just right now in your biggest jerky behavior and attitudes and lifestyle, God still loves you. And he's offering this unconditional love that you might know the love of God, not, not the religious rules and regulations of some uh, ogreish God, but the love and embracing relationship that he wants to have with you. As a child, I know that's hard to grasp, but that's our God. He is a God of love. He's not looking for you so he can punish you. He's looking for you so he can protect you and bless you. Amen? We're imperfect in the presence of God because God is absolutely perfect. That shouldn't surprise any of us. So we're vulnerable. What are we vulnerable to? To the exposure of our frailty, of our weaknesses, of our ignorances. And it makes us afraid. I'm, the, I'm a guy, yeah? so guys don't normally like to say that scares me, you know? This scares me, and I ain't afraid of nothing. You know what I'm saying? It's, it is. It's, it's just not normal for humans to 
grasp this. But that's why we have to have a God like we have in order to make it possible for us to experience this. How do we handle it? How do we handle the anxiety, the stress, the fear, the, the condition of our temple? We hide. We hide. We, we die behind the bush. We're, we're scrambling for something that will cover our sense of shame, our sense of unworthiness. If that means drugs, if it means alcohol, if it means broken relationships, if it just means stupid behavior, we'll, we'll do anything and try anything to escape the reality of how we see ourselves. But I'm telling you the truth. God is still walking through the garden. Amen? He's walking in our lives. He's looking for people. He's asking the same old question. Where are you? And humanity's monotonous answer is the same. I was afraid because I was exposed, because I was naked, because I know you know. So I hid myself. Genesis 3, verses 9 and 10. You know, Ron and I were talking about it's kind of like a bully or a lot of people that are just really kind of in your face, braggadocious, intimidating. 99.9% .9 of the time, every experience I've had like that, and believe me, I've had a lot of them, that person is scared of practice, and that's why they act the way they act. That's why they're so aggressive. That's why they're so threatening. And it's because they're afraid. And that's their bush. That's what they're hiding behind is this intimidation that don't let people get too close to me because they might see that I'm flawed. So I'm going to be big and tough and hard to get along with. Why? Because I'm scared and I need some place to hide. And this is my bush. Right? The Lord God called unto Adam and he said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Praise the Lord. Just like Tim said over and over, and it's so true. And it's worth repeating. We can't hide from God. You can't hide your stupid from Him. You can't hide your behavior from Him. Why would you have to? When He says, just as you are, with your stupid, you know, with your bush, come. I'll receive you. With all of your pitiful behavior and activities, I'm seeing you as a child that I love. And I'm willing to give myself totally for you. If you were the only one, with all your messed up stuff, I still love you. God's asking, where are you? And he's not asking for his information. Believe me, he doesn't need us to tell him where we are. He knows where we are. He knows all of our stuff. Better than we even know it. He's asking for Adam's sake. Adam had come out of hiding before God could begin the process of what Adam and Eve. In other words, he had to come out from the bushes in order for God to do what only God could do to deliver him. We have to do the same thing. Mankind, nothing has changed as far as man and God are concerned. He made a tragic choice. But God is not willing to hold us to it. He'll give us another opportunity, and another opportunity, and another opportunity. You know, to live in denial is to live in defeat. And that's why, although God never requires performance from us, He always requires honesty. Yes. Praise the Lord. It's, sometimes it's difficult to be honest with fears. He never judges us. He just wants us to know, hey, I see all your crap, and I still love you. It hasn't changed anything about how I feel about you. If you can be honest with yourself, believe me, God is saying it's okay. It's all right to be messed up. You're a human, and I love you. You're my creation. You are a child. In fact, you know, admitting that we have bushes we hide behind is just about all we can do. We can't make ourselves holy. We can't make ourselves righteous. About the only thing we can do is say, yeah, I'm still hiding. There's a part of me that i got to hide. There's, there's some of me that is still struggling. We're hopelessly and helplessly bound by fear and shame. And have been and were for thousands of years. Until the last Adam comes. Now he 
has come, but he may not have come for you yet. He's come for you, but you may not have responded to him yet. So this last Adam comes, and he takes the punishment for our deadly sins, for our choice of death rather than life. Praise the Lord. And he makes it possible for us to receive the love of God's good news, which is, I come to deliver you. I come to save you. Here's the deal. Once we admit our fear, we renounce our bush. And we trust his love. Then he removes our bush. Praise the Lord. And he replaces it with the relationship with him. Praise God. Believe me, we all got bushes. But the sooner we can let go of them and trust in his uncensored, unjudged love. Just his open, honest love. We get free. We get free from not only our bushes, but from the bushes of other people around us. First John chapter 4, verse 8 through 10. You know, we see a lot of anger, a lot of hatred, a lot of bitterness, a lot of division. What is that? It's bushes, man. I'm telling you, it's bushes. It's people hiding because they know inside they're a loser, they're a bummer, they're a screwed up, they're making poor choices, they rejected God, they tried to make themselves their own God or made somebody else their God. They're afraid. And, uh, and, and they act with a lot of bravado and, and threatening and intimidating when in fact with the more they threaten and intimidate, the more I realize how scared they really are. He said, here is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. It's relationship with the one who is love. He's not like us trying to love. He can't help himself. That's who he is. That's his reality. There's a solution to the problem of hiding behind bushes. And all the fire and the brimstone preaching is not going to do what love can do. All the threatening, all the demanding, all the judgment, all the rituals, all the rules, all the laws are not going to change anything. It's love that people need. That's why God came to give them love and not rules and regulations. But man chose the rules. And then wonder why. Because they're bushes, man. There's something to hide behind. There's something you can use rather than have to stand there before God and say, look, I'm flawed, man. I need God. It's what love will do. It's what grace has done. Yes. When Adam and Eve sinned and their nakedness was exposed, innocent blood had to be shed. God took the life of an innocent animal and he covered their nakedness with his skin. That took care of the external problem, but it didn't resolve the reality of shame and rebellion. They had to leave the garden because of that rebellion. God covered it. He covered their, externally, he covered their shame. But internally, they were still a mess, and they could not remain in the garden. Then several thousand years passed, and there was another Adam who did not choose the knowledge of good and evil, but the tree of life. He lived 33 and a half years on earth in a dependent relationship with the Father. Totally dependent. I can do nothing with myself. I only do what I see my Father do. I only say what I hear my Father say. He enjoyed God. And he expressed perfect love on earth for that 33 and a half years. Eventually, he even went so far as to assume the guilt of the first Adam and all of his descendants. second Adam had to leave the garden too, even though he had no guilt. But by doing it, he paid the price. Remember he was in the garden praying, if, if, you know, if there's any way, let this pass. Let me stay here, God. He said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will. 
about religion? Because instead of casting out fear, we go to religion and we have even more fear. Now they're trying to scare us into serving God. I'm not talking about every church. I'm talking about the way religion operates. Instead of exposing the love of God, it exposes our need for a bush. And fear is the result. And then we try to come up with a good behavior and that becomes our bush. Because we know it's fake. It's only good part of the time. It's only good when I'm in the mood for it. It's only good when people cooperate with it. Like Tim said, it would have been really easy for him to say, hey, you're acting like a jerk, man. Work with somebody else. I, I, don't, I don't need this. But no, he, he realized, this guy, he's hiding behind the bush here. Let's, let's see if we can't get him to come out from behind the bush. And then we can communicate. Then he doesn't have to feel guilty and ashamed. And I don't have to feel judgmental. And what happens? He's patient. He shows It doesn't 
doesn't stop. Since there's no human basis for its beginning, then there's nothing that we can do to end it. God's perfect love is eternal love. It never stops. It will never stop. It can't be earned by what we do. It can't be forfeited by what we don't do. You can choose to receive it, or you can choose to ignore it. But you can't stop it. You can't end it. You just end the benefit that you get from it. It goes on, it goes on, and it goes on for every human being, as long as there is breath in the body. God won't force you to enjoy his love. But you can't stop him from offering it. Again and again and again. But here's a promise, and it's based on the word of God. Every time you choose to embrace love, another of your bushes will fall away. And you can become more of who you really are in Christ. Free. More able to simple statement as you can make. That means if there's any bondage in our lives, any bushes, somewhere, consciously or unconsciously, we have internalized an inaccurate definition of reality. Can you hear what I said? If there's any bondage, if there's any fear, if there's any darkness, if there's any sense of separation from God or, or that God doesn't love me or that God's going to punish me or that God hates me or that people are, are evil and all this other stuff. If there's any of those conscious or unconscious, it, it's simply telling us we have internalized we've we received something because truth will make you free. We, we ingested something other than the truth somewhere. Somewhere we're believing things that are not true. They're not in agreement with the word of God and that's what we're afraid of. There is no fear in love. If we understand that, the truth will make you free. Unless you really believe that God is love, you're going to struggle with solution, man. You're going to have problems with your own self-identity. darkness and drop. 
how we are supposed to relate to one another. And that's how we liberate each other from the bushes. We love you. Even if you act stupid. But you're obligated to love me. If I ever act stupid. <laughs> so, at least once a week. So <laughs> Amen? That's how we liberate each other from the bushes. We love each other. He said, love, listen to Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So if we don't accept the love of God on the level that he's trying to get us to, it's impossible for us to love anybody else, including ourselves. Self-loathing is one of the biggest motivators for crime and, and uh, self-harm and energy. Ron, we've had this conversation. All of us, as children, probably felt bad, like you were a bad kid or you were you know, you weren't as smart as the kid set across from you, or you weren't as good looking, or you weren't as big, or you weren't as athletic, or whatever it might have been, anything, to demean yourself. And so we act out of that. We're free to step out into the garden if we'll accept the love of God. Get out of the bushes and back into the garden to know God and to enjoy Him. Psalms 31, verse 18 and 19. This is just, I want to just briefly touch on this. This is for the people who think they are in power, who think they rule, who think they control, who think that God doesn't have any part in our government, in our Congress, in our Senate. And we've heard him actually say that. Uh, 
uh, going to get you God, but let's have a party. Let's eat the sweet. Let's drink, or let's drink the sweet. Let's eat the fat. Let's celebrate. Let's not be greedy. Let's be happy. Yeah. Let's let people see how good our God is. Yeah. Make great mirth. Ha! 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 Have fun! Mirth! Happy! I mean, that's the, that's the reason for these idiotic puns and things that I do in the beginning. God's in a good mood all the time. I know so they're painful. Right? <laughs> but it gives you something to laugh at, even if it's my ignorance and sharing them. It's something just to get you out of the box, out of the thinking of, here we are in church again. And, oh, boy, what are we going to do? How are we going to make it through this week? And just relax. Be filled with mirth. Drink some sweet stuff. Whatever that might be for you, praise the Lord. Eat some fat. Have some ribs, man. And a brisket. Right? Some good chicken. Because they understood the words that were declared to them. Yes. Praise God. Truth sets us free. Free to receive love. Free to give love. Free to enjoy life with God. And the strength to live That's my word for you this morning. I'm going to embrace it. Take this. I'm not talking about being deep. I'm talking about being the truth. God is love. And his love will never fail. And he'll never, he'll never leave you or forsake you. It's simply a choice you make to receive it or to reject it. That's the only difference in this world if we look around. I don't care what country they're in. I don't care what culture they're from. I don't care what ethnicity they have. Doesn't matter. Every one of them, God has reached to in the same way that He has to us. Yes. Saying, I love you. You're forgiven. Mm -hmm. Just receive my love and my forgiveness. And you have eternal life. You're my child. I go spend the just watching you. That will never watch or hear any of this. This this is God. This is God trying to tell us. We've complicated things long enough. Yes. Let's keep it simple, Susan. Right? Kiss. Let God be God. And let's just learn to love and receive love. Amen. Let's come out of the verses. Amen? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Give the Lord a hand clap this morning. <laughs> Hallelujah. God love you. We love you. Praise the Lord. Have a great week in the Lord. Let's grow up into this truth. Let's live our lives in the love that God has given us so that we can share that love with others who have never experienced it. In Jesus' name. Ron, would you like to share something? Uh, just a comment. I asked the Lord once, way, 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 way back, you know, in early years, you know, I said, why can't they see the truth? He says, Ron, because they believe the lie as true. And you just said,
unless you have 